medicine, vaccinations, antibiotics, disease prevention, healthcare coverage. These are the pillars of social welfare and public health infrastructure. A mere 100 years ago, the field of public health was remarkably different than it is today. With incredibly high mortality rates, poor infectious disease policies, and a growing populace, 20th century America demanded urgent change. A primary constriction to resolving these issues was the lack of women who felt empowered to pursue medicine, which would secure better outcomes for the distressed nation. This demanding field of study, while relatively unexplored, was a male-dominated profession. However, this did not deter women of all backgrounds and races from deconstructing social expectations to revolutionize medicine. From America's emerging role in STEM came a vast array of trailblazing female figures with a passion for protecting the health of all people in a society rife with economic disparities and weak social welfare nets. Tuberculosis, or TB, a manifestation of the meningitis bacterial strain, was the dominant chronic infectious disease of the first half of the 20th century. However, Colorado's Dr. Florence Rena Sabin emerged as a woman who broke barriers, who worked under the lens of discrimination and oppression to conduct unprecedented tuberculosis studies and reform public health on a global scale. Her findings not only modernized public health in Colorado, but also underscored the metamorphic power of medicine. During the early 20th century, America's public health systems required a revolutionary change to secure positive health outcomes for a growing nation, as millions lacked access to preventive medicine. Communicable diseases and pandemics aggressively circulated the globe, resulting in an average global life expectancy of 32 years in 1900. In the early 19th century, America underwent a massive period of industrialization, coupled with widespread urbanization, immigration, and the advent of the transcontinental railroad. This immediate shift catalyzed migration from rural towns to urban communities, leading to overcrowded housing, inadequate public water supplies, and defunct waste disposal systems. These conditions facilitated repeated outbreaks of cholera, dysentery, TB, typhoid fever, influenza, yellow fever, and malaria, diseases that had no cures. Furthermore, the advent of the automobile in the late 19th century stimulated urban and suburban growth. This exacerbated crowded living conditions and the transmission of communicable diseases amongst a burgeoning citizenry. By 1920, the proportion of the population that dwelt in urban communities exceeded that of rural towns. Cities promised business opportunities, rewarding jobs, cultural richness, and personal freedom. Additionally, urban areas offered valuable amenities not accessible to those in rural communities, and cities also supported immigrant populations and diverse demographic groups. While urbanization is generally regarded as integral to economic prosperity, it exposed the fragile nature of our country, especially in regard to public health. Florence Rena Sabin was born on November 9, 1871 in Central City, Colorado, to George and Serena Sabin. George worked as a mine manager, and the family was relatively affluent. Her sister Mary was two years older than Florence. Serena's death during childbirth, when Florence was just seven years old, sparked the young girl's interest in the sciences and improving health outcomes for those in need. Her father, George, always pushed the girls to achieve higher education in hopes of securing a successful career and becoming self-sufficient. In response to this urge, Florence displayed a strong penchant for math and science from an early age. Between 1885 and 1889, she attended the prestigious Vermont Academy in Saxons River, Vermont, along with her sister Mary. While intending to pursue a career in music, Florence was naturally drawn to the sciences, attending Smith College in Massachusetts to major in zoology and mathematics. In 1893, Johns Hopkins opened a new co-educational school of medicine, the first year the school had accepted any woman. It was at this time that she fully realized her passion for medicine, but did not yet have enough money to cover tuition. Thus, she taught for three years at Wolf Hall Private School in Denver, and by 1896, she was admitted to Johns Hopkins as one of 14 women in a class of 45 students. Although Johns Hopkins upheld rigid standards and judged men and women equally for admission, there were no female professors, and male students greatly outnumbered the women. The best research projects and hospital internships almost always went to the men. However, these disparities did not quell her spirit, and Florence even encouraged her female colleagues to exhibit confidence in their medical aptitude. 
As previously mentioned, urban communities were severely impacted by the onslaught of infectious diseases. Living in the heart of Denver, Dr. Sabin recognized early on that she needed to find a transformative approach to modern medicine. Impressed by Sabin's serious demeanor and intellectual remarks, Dr. Franklin Mall, chair of the anatomy department at Johns Hopkins, became her mentor, her role model for both scientific work and teaching. Like Sabin, Dr. Mall was highly qualified and devoted to developing medical science in America. Believing that women and men were equally capable, Dr. Mall tasked Florence with a seemingly insurmountable challenge to study the origins of lymphatic vessels. We know that the lymphatic system manages fluid levels in the body, but at the time, this network mystified anatomists. Based on previous experiments, scientists had determined that the lymph channels were open, not closed. However, Dr. Sabin, by injecting colored substances into the lymph channels of animal embryos, revealed that lymph structures came directly from the vein tissues and were closed, not open. Her revolutionary findings were published in several journals and marked a turning point in her ability to impact public health on a broader scale. Although the Johns Hopkins Medical School had previously resisted hiring any woman to the faculty, Sabin's excellent performance convinced the trustees to hire her as an assistant instructor in 1902. By 1917, Dr. Sabin was appointed Professor of Histology in the Department of Anatomy at Johns Hopkins, becoming the first woman to hold a professorship there. Despite profuse ostracization and discrimination in the workplace, she remained a vocal advocate for women's rights. By 1925, she became the first woman elected to the National Academy of Sciences. During this time, she led a group of scientists trying to find a cure for tuberculosis, the leading cause of death in the United States at the time. Her research yielded a much better understanding of the disease, highlighting a relationship between the tuberculosis bacteria chemistry and the immune responses to it. Her approach generated much new knowledge about the tuberculosis infection, revealing the importance of monocytes in specialized cells in disease prevention. In an interview with Dr. Katie Dickinson, a professor of environmental and occupational health at the Colorado School of Public Health, she communicated that we have significantly advanced in our ability to provide health services to the entire population. She referenced that this is largely due to reduced barriers and a strengthened healthcare infrastructure, and her laboratory team is actively working on a science-driven approach to reduce disparities in health equity across the state. Today, more than 100 years after Dr. Sabin's tenure, nearly half of all medical school students nationwide are female, reflecting a change in both the face and character of medicine. After retiring in 1938 at the age of 67, Sabin moved back to Colorado, where she officiated the post-war health committee. Despite completing a successful career, she remained committed to improving Denver's sanitation and enforcing health regulations. This charitable mentality translated into superior health outcomes for both Colorado citizens and the nation at large. The high-pressure injector used at Guy's Hospital sends the vaccine through the pores of the skin and you don't feel a thing. There's no needle to be sterilized for every jab. No Dr. Sabin was appalled by the fact that people died in Colorado at twice the rate of other states, and many of these deaths were preventable. Also, the state's health laws were outdated, not having been updated in over half a century. Rat infestations and poor sewage management contributed to a host of deadly illnesses. So as a response, Dr. Sabin drafted a series of public health bills to remedy the situation. Passed in 1947 by the Colorado State Legislature, these bills signified a monumental turning point in Colorado history. They completely reorganized the State Board of Health and provided medical care to underserved populations. After her death on October 3, 1953, at the age of 81, Dr. Sabin had left an ineffaceable legacy on U.S. society. Newspaper articles commemorated her as a teacher, research scientist, and public health leader. Colorado took pride in having a native Coloradan receive world renown as a scientist. This citizen-funded statue of Dr. Sabin was given to the National Statuary Hall Collection by Colorado in 1959. From this point on, she was forever inscribed as a crusader for improving public health. Dr. Florence Rena Sabin's unparalleled strides to improve public health outcomes marked a turning point in the lives, opportunities, and freedoms for all.